Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to yet another edition of the Library History Channel on Focus on Liberia. My name is Dennis Jai, and we're broadcasting from Atlanta, Georgia. In tonight's edition of the Library History Channel, we are dealing with part three of President William B. S. Tubman in our long running series, The Presidents of Liberia. We have covered from Joseph Jenkins Roberts all the way, and now we are on President William B. S. Tubman. Let me welcome our mayoral presenters. First, starting with our chief presenter, <laughs> Carl Family. Carl, welcome to the show. Always my pleasure to be here. Let me also welcome our co-presenter, Darius Lam, a.k.a. Jabari or Basabari. Mr. Basoyun, welcome to the show. It's good to be back. We want to welcome all our viewers from across the globe. This is uh, the <clears throat> Librarian History Channel. This is where we discuss Librarian history. Of course, Librarian history. We've been dealing with President Tubman, and let's start by just a brief review of uh, where we've been with President Tubman. Carl? So we've covered uh, his genealogy as we do with all the presidents uh, who he descends from, um, where his people came from before migrating to uh, the, the colony of Maryland. And then after that, we talked about his highlights of his human capital development we didn't really do infrastructure development. I think um, we kind of glanced over that uh, JFK hospital, all of the road projects, the schools, um, especially the government infrastructure and all those things that he put into place, uh, the mining concessions and so all of the infrastructure that goes along with those things. We didn't get too much into it, but the main focus last Saturday was uh, the human capital development. And I think we really thoroughly covered that today it's really Tudman's legacy in Africa as a whole, because Tudman was really the president of Africa at one point. You know, he was really the leading president. And when Tudman, during Tudman's presidency, Liberia led Africa into independence. And that is not something uh, that we really talk about. And uh, even other African countries, because of our own um, issues we have in Liberia, our failure to recognize and acknowledge um, anything positive about our country and its contribution to other parts of the world. Because of that, the rest of the world also ignores Liberia's tremendous contribution to African liberation. Thank you. Jabari, you know, as a, uh, Afro, uh, as a Basso man of African American descent, <laughs> what is, I mean, when you hear about Tubman outside of Liberia, what, what's the first thing that comes to you? Really just infrastructure and really the Monrovia group. That's really what Tubman is most outside of Liberia known for. The Monrovia group. Carl was telling you that I, I represented my high school and we're discussing this thing. <laughs> and I look back, yeah. you know, how I... I was so not happy with Tutman. <laughs> yeah. And, and when, yeah. You, when you are young and you're full of energy and you are presented with, you know, this thing, you read about them and you you don't even care for the nuances, right? You're going full mm -hmm. blast. And so I remember my energy and, and I look back and say, well, I think I did a good job. But let's hear from someone who has done a little more research and able to present us with even new information. Let's yes. get this going, and we want to welcome our viewers from across the globe. Please uh, invite a friend. These things have not really been taught in Labyrinth schools, and so this is a perfect opportunity for all of us to be informed about our country. Presidents of Labyrinth series, we started with Joseph Jenkins Roberts, so it has taken us a long time. Now we are at President Tubman. Most likely, we're going to be stopping, you know, at this point, President Tubman, so that we leave uh, the most modern presidents with our current, uh, you know, situation. Yeah. Pe people know a lot about the rest of the people or the presidents, and so we may likely not go further than President Tubman. But let's mm -hmm. put on President Tubman tonight. 
Yeah, so when when uh, Tubman took over, as we discussed in the previous episode, um, Liberia, Ethiopia, Egypt, and South Africa were the were the only independent countries on the continent of Africa. Everything else was basically an extraction and exploitation center for Europe and, and for European powers. Um, Tubman took over Africa at a period when many African leaders uh, for the other independent states, especially the, I mean, South Africa is counted in that, and they had just you know gotten their independence from the United Kingdom. But as we know, the majority of the people in South Africa um, were trying to get their independence from the people who got the independence from the United Kingdom, the Boers and whatnot, that have been there for many generations. And you had Egypt, which though Egypt was independent, you had an invasion of Arabs that had happened, you know, several hundred years earlier, and there was much chaos there as well. Um, Ethiopia had many tribal issues. Um, the Maharic people being the ruling class and everyone else having absolutely um, almost being non-existent as far as the government was concerned. And you had these issues going on that were very extreme in these independent countries. So Tudman takes over at a time when he's very suspicious So of Arabs and what we can term Asiatic Africans, Arabized or Africans that seem to have Asian, strong Asian um, ancestry. As we all know, during this time period in the 1940s, Ethiopians generally considered themselves something other than Negro. They called themselves white Africans. They called themselves uh, uh, Caucasians. He- dark-skinned Caucasians, they called themselves Hebrews, they called themselves many, many things other than identifying with the stereotypical Negro um, Sub-Saharan African. And then you have South Africa, which is extremely white supremacist and outlawed intermarriage between white people and anyone else. It was illegal to even live in the same communities. It was illegal for black South Africans to attend school with white South Africans. It was illegal for black South Africans to be in white South African neighborhoods to attend church with them. These were laws that you could be convicted, prosecuted, I'm sorry, prosecuted, convicted and imprisoned for breaking. And all of the black South Africans were removed from their traditional land and placed in townships. Mm -hmm. What they call reservations. Reservation style badlands that did not even have, um, you know, places to farm. And I just skimmed over Egypt a bit because people have a tendency to believe that Egyptians are Arabs. The people who conquered Egypt are Arabs. And so they did a similar thing to and almost wiped out almost a genocide against the indigenous people of of Egypt. There are still remnants and pockets of them existing, but it was almost a complete wipeout of that population. So you had a situation where Tudman, being a president of a country that was established essentially to unite Africa. We don't really talk about that in Liberian history. But the whole purpose, Liberia was really supposed to be the continent of Africa. If you listen to those early speeches of Joseph Zinka Roberts, they wanted to unite the entire continent under one umbrella of Africanism. Tudman, at this point, fast forward to 1944, when he takes over, he's very, very suspicious and uncomfortable with the the Muhammad uh, Yusuf of, of Morocco who was the king of Morocco, the ancestor of the present king of Morocco, or the grandfather, I should say. So there's a lot of, um, uh, what is the word I'm looking for? Apprehension. Tudman did not feel, uh, and he articulated this. He didn't think Arabs were black people. (laughs) And like there was a Negro nation and he really was suspicious of them. I want to over, over emphasize other people were not necessarily as racial in their approach. 
Jabari, would you like to add anything? I'm trying to be very diplomatic here. <laughs> no, nah, not too much. I would just say that at that time, you have to factor in the fact that even in South Africa, it was illegal for Black people to travel. Black people were not citizens of, of the territory. If you look at a, a South African passport from that time, it'll say just Black. But when you see a white passport, it will say citizen of the, the Union of South Africa. You have a situation with Ethiopia that just got free three years from Italian occupation because Ethiopia was invaded in 36 by Italy. And it wasn't until 1941 that mm -hmm. Italy was officially free of the uh, Italian occupation that happened. Um, Egypt is, is still, it's not really independent. Britain still has a substantial control over Egypt. So that's really what's going on at that time. Yes. And uh, it, it's very easy now to think, I mean, like at the time Tottenham took over, basically you just have these uh, very few independent countries that you can count right. on one hand, not even one hand. This with, is With very serious racial problems. Right. And very serious ethnic problems. In the case of Ethiopia, it's not a racial problem, even though they're reading from the playbook of white supremacy, they think they're white. It's really an ethnic issue. So their Damhara the are, are different from you know the Eritreans and all of these people that have subsequently broken away the Omoro and all these other ethnic groups, large ethnic groups that were in Ethiopia, were all being subjugated by the Amharic for, for many centuries, actually. So there's hundreds of year old ethnic tensions in Ethiopia, hundreds of year old genocide and, and serious suppression in Egypt of the indigenous Egyptians. There is a, well, it is apartheid in South Africa, which we, we thoroughly described. And, and so you have Tudman looking at these other three countries, even though he did, you know, connect more with Haile Selassie than the others, because Tudman saw Selassie as, as an African. And the independent states, um, he didn't really see them as being African states. Oh, and Egypt, uh, just 100 years ago, was um, under Ottoman rule. So we, it hasn't been 50 years since Egypt uh, was um, taken from the Ottoman Empire. It used to be part of the Ottoman Empire until 1896 when Britain took right. over. Right, so. so yeah. So they, the the Arabs who were being anyway. Does yeah clarification. Yeah. They got independence from their from their cousins essentially. And <laughs> still mm -hmm. still foreign invaders. Um mm -hmm. so this is a map. This is a map of African countries and when they became independent. I don't know if you can blow that up if people can really see it. I mean, you've got Morocco, which is a significant part of this presentation, 1956. So Morocco didn't get independent until 1956, along with Tunisia. Libya was much earlier, 1951, right? And then you have, of course, Egypt, 1922, which we've already said was already independent. Um, and then at the time of Tubman, Eritrea was not separated from Ethiopia, so and neither was... Um, you know, some of these countries, Djibouti, these are new countries. But you add Sudan, um, was 1956, and this is before there was North and South Sudan. Um, I'm just pulling out relevant things to the Tubman era. Um, Somalia, 1960. Um, Ghana, 1957. West. Sierra right. Leone, 1961. Guinea, 19. So, let, yeah, let's go over to West Africa, as Jabari is doing. And the reason I did all of these other countries first is because the idea of independence even before full-on colonialism, the idea of a modern African state was born in Liberia. And from Liberia, and because it was born in Liberia, after the 1880s, after the Berlin Conference, we've discussed this numerous times and dissected this, Liberia becomes the target of an international embargo trade and economic embargo because of what it was representing it represented it was an affront to global imperialism of europe and her her 
children, her descendants, right? Liberia represented everything that they wanted to avoid. So the entire time Liberia remains independent, even though it loses a third of its territory or more, even though Liberia remains independent, and because it remains independent, it continues to be a target because it is an inspiration to others. Unlike Ethiopia, unlike anywhere else, which got independent much later, of course, the other countries, but unlike Ethiopia, which was a kingdom, really old, you know, um, monarch, here is Liberia with actual laws where this, they have citizens who have rights that the, are not bestowed upon them by a king that can give them and take them away at will. This is an incredible thing. And so it is a constant thorn. Liberia represents a constant thorn in the side of colonialism. This is why it has been attacked. This is why every presidential uh, uh, series we go through, it's always a repetition of a nonstop, consistent and continuous bombardment of economic, uh, uh, economic attacks, physical attacks, disinformation attacks, anything that they can do. It has been a target of every divide and conquer campaign you can imagine Liberia has been. So it becomes a situation where in spite of all of that, it still serves as a beacon of hope for everyone else. And after World War II, and Europe becomes weaker, and after the 1920s and 30s, especially after 1943, when Europe recognizes that, hey, the United States of America was able to economically annex a politically independent country the United States of America was able to get, you know, not didn't have to take away Liberians' semblance of sovereignty. They could let them believe they were sovereign politically and then take away their economic self-determination, which is the, the Achilles heel of a nation. And Liberia didn't have the military might or the economic resources to resist. The other thing is Liberia doesn't have a country that it's exploiting to enrich itself. What we forget is that Africa has wealth, but the wealth is extracted and taken elsewhere. And all of these countries that are building these massive militaries, the wealth that they have has come through exploiting, enslaving, and this has not happened, not only for Liberia, but for Black Africa. So when you become independent and you don't have colonies that you can exploit labor and resources from to enrich yourself, you must now compete with people who have enriched themselves through violence, genocide, theft, all kinds of means that are no longer an option. You also have boundaries that were drawn without regard to who lived there. You have boundaries that were established, even the boundaries for what we call Ethiopia, which was Abyssinia, those had changed. Because as they colonized, they took some of even the territory of Abyssinia, right? So even the original Ethiopia is not really exactly the same territory. So even the old, never colonized area lost territory. So Abyssinia, which is modern day called Ethiopia, their boundaries have changed. Libya, Algeria, Egypt, boundaries have changed. They create fictitious landlocked places like Chad and Niger, Mali. 
they've carved out land without regard to the human beings. So all over Africa, you have ethnic groups falling on different sides of boundaries, literally family members split up because of these fictitious boundaries, these imaginary lines that were drawn by people other than themselves. So even as they strive for independence, the mindset of the average African, whether it be West, East or Southern Africa is to think first of themselves as what were we doing before these Europeans came? Instead of thinking, what do we need to do to be stronger and more competitive and avoid ever being conquered, whether it be physically or economically? So the thought process is multifold, but I'm going to talk about two because this is not, we don't have, you know, this is not a three credit course in Pan-Africanism. This is just a show <laughs> for a couple of, you know, an hour or so. So you've got two, two things going on at the same time. On one hand, you have people who are trying to go backward and think of themselves tribally. Then you have a very small group of people who are going forward and thinking of themselves in the context of surviving into the future. What is going to make us strong enough to resist what is happening? Even if we become independent, do we in, erase the boundaries and unite ourselves under the richest, most powerful federation on the planet? Hmm. Or do we revert to some archaic period where we cling only to our language that we speak and the villages we come from, which is going to benefit our children and our future, which is going to make us wealthy and powerful, which option is going to make it impossible for the rest of the world to step on us? What is going to make us stronger? What makes Europe and her allies stronger? So some people, the solution is federation. And for others, the solution is, we just have a loose alliance. Yeah, we're all black, but so what? We don't have the language, we don't have the same religion. Y'all light skin, we dark skin, y'all funny looking, we, we, we fine. We're not gonna, we're not the same people. Me and my house are men. I'm not even the same as a Fulani. Why would I wanna unite with Yoruba? You know, so it is a complex situation. You have the King of Morocco saying we need federation. And then you have people saying, especially Liberians saying, yeah, we might want federation, but we don't want you inside. Uh, I have my own, my own take on that. Uh, you can come in there. You can cover there. Right, because it's a multi, it's a multifaceted thing, but we have to look at all the points of view. We and also have to look at it. We also look at it. It wasn't just between the federation and the loose uh, alliance. You had regional federations that wanted to be established. So you have uh, situations where you have the United States of Latin Africa and Central Africa. You have those in East Africa. Uh, mm -hmm. One small example would be. Uh, Tanzania, which used to be the Republic of Tanganyika in Zanzibar. They used to be two different countries. They merged into one. You have the... And we're going to get into all those divisions. Yeah. I mean, you can do it now, too. You can, I yeah. mean, we've got, you know, the African National Congress in Southern Africa has a different yeah. perspective. All of them um, are trying to figure out how do we yes. rearrange ourselves prior to Europeans, but in the modern sense. And there's been a union of South Africa, which, you know, had the ANC, you know, within its boundaries. You even had a succession movement um, and you had, a, you know, countries that South Africa, within the South African territory that Liberia recognized as a country, but an, an independent African countries recognized as a country, but South Africa didn't recognize. You know, so you had all kinds of stuff going on. And the, the, the main issue really is trust and this the idea that even before colonialism in fact colonialism was possible because african people were so easily tribalized so easily convinced 
that the reason they were suffering was because of the language they spoke and not because they were black. It was so easy for them to suppress and oppress Africans based on them being black, but also tell Africans, no, 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 it's those Bantus over there, they're the problem. Oh, it's, it's those Fulani, they're the problem. It's the Wahutu. You want to see a cool. It's this other group. It's very easy to do. Even to this day, we have not learned. Very easy to do. You can go to the next slide. So before before I, I really um before I even get into this so much. Um so the 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 meeting of African people, the gathering of African people, I should say, um, occurred in Accra on the 17th of April, 1954. So this precedes, this predates um, both the Casablanca Conference and it also predates the uh, Monrovia uh, Conference, okay? So in 1954, um, this Pan-African Conference, and Pan-Africanism is as old as Liberia. Pan-Africanism really the roots of it are as old as Liberia. And it really continued. Um, so there were lots of Pan-African conferences even before independence with the Caribbean, African-Americans meeting in London and all these kinds of things. But what happens in 1954, you have Pan-African organizations in the 1920s, all during periods of colonialism. So there's always been resistance and it, it, it's been resistance from the day of first day of colonialism. Why are you colonizing us? Liberia is free. They look just like us, they can govern themselves, so can we. So in Ghana in 1954, the, um, Kwame Nkrumah invites you know, all of the independent uh, African countries um, to come to Accra and they have this meeting and they're discussing this need to erase borders. And possibly the debate was, do we have five countries or do we have a massive country? That's really what it was. Are we gonna have regional nations and those regional countries, so you got the West Africa, East Africa, so, uh, uh, East and Central Africa, Southern Africa and North Africa. And then they're gonna all form these economic alliances, these five massive, I'm sorry, these four massive countries are gonna find an econ form an economic alliance. And even if they had done that, it would have been a tremendous force to reckon with. Each country would have been incredibly rich human resource wise, economically, the diversity would have created such an economic boom within these nations. It would have been nearly impossible as long as they didn't start talking tribal, 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 it would have worked. You got the rise of so many African thinkers. Kwame Nkrumah is like, listen, when he got his country, he didn't say we're going to name this place Ashanti. He didn't say we're going to name this place Akan. Ewe. He said we're going to go back into ancient Africa. We're going to find a name that has nothing to do with any of these tribes in Ghana. I'm going to call it Ghana because the ancient empire of Wagadu the leaders of Wagadu were called the Ghana of Wagadu. And none of us are descendants of Wagadu. So we're going to call the place Ghana. We're the land of kings. So he borrowed a name from ancient West Africa, which is a, a place that was located in the Senegal, Mali area today. And he borrowed this name and he put it on his country so that no ethnic group could have claim to it. We are the land of kings. We are the Ghana. And his vision was, I'm going to build infrastructure that will benefit all of West Africa. But his long-term goal was that Liberia, Nigeria, Ivory Coast, Togo, Guinea, 
Cameroon even, Senegal, Gambia, Equatorial, I'm not sorry, Equatorial, Guinea-Bissau, Mali, Western oh. Sahara, were all supposed to be, Niger, Burkina Faso, this is before all these names, it was Upper Volta, all these things, but he wanted these to be a country. So he's talking about any infrastructure he's building, regional. Any plan he's doing, regional. And what's happening in his country? The tribalism coming. Why do you want to help these other countries? There's our resources. Why do you want to do this for them? Let's get rid of this guy. Is he crazy? These artificial boundaries that were drawn, they didn't want him to cross them because they were very real in their minds. So this conference in 1954 was talking about choosing between these two options. And Kwame Nkrumah was okay with regional governments, regional countries. But even that was met with staunch resistance. And some of the resistance were people who were naturally not comfortable with it, but a lot of it was incitement. Go into that meeting and chakla things. Don't let him talk about his unity business. Because the powers that were releasing them from political uh, subjugation still wanted economic authority. And they knew that would be almost impossible if they erased these borders, even regionally. You have anything to add, Jabari? Not too much. Yeah, this was just warned by Kwame Nkrumah when he gives a speech later on. Okay, you want you want to read the speech right now? Oh no, the speech is just um talking about neo-colonialism. Him just yeah. more for forewarning neo-colonialism. Right, and and this is exactly he knew what was coming because he was a student of Edward Wilma Blyden in Liberia. He knew what happened to Liberia. Liberia was sovereign economically. Even they had all those embargoes against Liberia, refusing to trade because Liberia didn't want to do what they wanted them to do. So they would refuse to buy anything Liberia was selling, cut them off of the global trade network to try to starve them into submission. And when that didn't work, when people like Liberian leaders were like, you know what, we'll rather starve. We are men. We are not slaves again. We're not going to allow you to conquer us. If it means we stop, we stop. And they said, but what kind of hard-headed people are these? Okay, since they're so tough, we'll, economic, we'll stop the economic sabotage and we'll work to economically annex, which is probably the worst form of sabotage. I think the embargo is better. Earlier in the class, Jabari, we're talking about covert and overt, right? The embargo was an overt an overt sabotage of Liberia's economy. But the economic annexation and the bringing in of Firestone and other concessions was a covert sabotage of Liberia's economy because it came in like a good thing, like a gift. It came in like a gift. We're gonna create jobs. And y'all been suffering under this embargo. Your people didn't have jobs. You guys hardly had revenue. And you know, all these little, skirmishes on the crew coast. We might have had something to do with that, but we'll stop doing that if you guys cooperate. So now, now they have figured out the formula. Get, let them think that they have political autonomy, but it's really cash that rules the world. It's the economy, it's the land sovereignty. And even if you don't allow people to own land, if you give them dominion over the land without ownership, it's the same thing. If you give them all of your iron in your mountain for little of nothing, if you give them your agricultural land and let them grow rubber and exploit the raw latex out of your country, it's pretty much the same thing. So they knew because of what the United States successfully did, the brilliance of Roosevelt, President Roosevelt, and Hoover, you know, before him and everyone else, they knew 
the formula. The French, the British, they knew the formula. They knew that they could continue to extract and exploit even if they pretended to not have political control. Next slide, please. The United African States, commonly known as the Casablanca Group, was established in Casablanca, Morocco in 1960. The group was comprised of seven states, Morocco, Egypt, Libya, Ghana, Guinea, Mali, and Algeria. Algeria is also in there. Uh, African political unification or federation was its goal and transfer of many powers from national governments to a supranational Pan-African authority. Um, yeah. So, yeah. 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 so supranational, a supranational Pan-African authority just basically means that you would have states as a federation, yeah. and inside the federation, you have each state has some, and so they're recognizing these colonial boundaries as states, but there is going to be a supernatural national, which means that it is a federal centralized authority, which everything feeds into. Mm -hmm. And probably structured, the way they, they proposed to be structured was like a representative government, sort of how AOAU is structured without, but with authority, mm -hmm. with actual authority, with an actual constitution that all Africans would be a citizen. So you'd be carrying a passport just for Africa. And I want you all to think that, think about this. This stuff is an African, like everything else that we come up with, it's taken by the West and actualized, materialized. This mm -hmm. is what the European Union was born from was not the idea of Europeans to do this. It was the idea of Africans to do this. The Europeans sabotaged it and brought it into existence for themselves because they knew it would make them more powerful. Mm -hmm. They sabotaged it for Africa and had Africans running around talking about tribalism and they took it for themselves where they really actually have tribalism with all of their world wars, their big, gigantic, bloody tribal wars that they've had, they were still able to transcend that and unite around their Europeanness in order to maintain and sustain their economic grip on the planet. Power only works when you have numbers. Okay, you can have your little tribe. Your tribe doesn't mean anything against a more powerful entity that has larger numbers. It doesn't matter how hard you want to claim, cling to it or claim pride. The reality of it is numbers always will beat you. And more people means more power, which means more output, which is why it's better to have a unified or, or united front than individuals. So yes, exactly, Jabari. So what Europe did was they redefined their tribe. They redefined their ethnicity. So that if you're Italian or you're French, you're just a subset of a greater umbrella, which is to be a, a Western European. And they tell the world this is the pinnacle of it. So where they used to be rivals, they are now admiring each other. You now have free passage between the countries. Italians go to France for the weekend. Everyone they can get jobs anywhere they want to. They can go move around and work, and now their economies, which were being stifled a bit, are now stronger. The euro is strong because Europe is united. Western Europe is united, so the euro is strong. And this is not their idea. This was an African concept, and it was created in resistance so the, the tool, the mechanism we created for our liberation was sabotaged and used by our oppressors to strengthen themselves even more and fortify themselves even more. Mm -hmm. Right. And, 
And, and so Cobb, that, that's the debate. That's the debate people continue to have, right? Because the idea that, well, this was our idea. Somebody came and sabotaged it because we didn't. We were babies, and but they took it, perfected it, and actualized it, and now they are benefiting from it. Here are we in disarray. We are so poor. We are not united. I mean, how how do we really say that? But right. say that again, Dennis. I didn't understand. Right. What, what I mean is, uh, even today, it's like we are blaming somebody else, right? Like, okay, this was our idea, but we were not smart enough to uh, maintain it. Somebody came, sabotage us, took it, perfected it, actualized it, and now they are benefiting from it. So I they don't are think. For, it so has I don't, nothing. I don't, I, oh, I don't think. Worry. Hang on one second. Oh. I don't think. I don't think this is about blame. One of the things that I love that white supremacy has taught people is that when they speak the truth, they use the word, they teach you that you're blaming. We're not blaming. We're saying what happens. Mm -hmm. Right? What, if, what somebody, if somebody steals from you, hmm. if somebody steals from you, if somebody sabotages you, if somebody who has already been, has been, has colonized you and miseducated you, comes in now, even with your miseducation and you still have your brilliance and your resistance, and then they come in and orchestrate a sabotage of that resistance, murder people who mm -hmm. don't comply, and we say it, this is not about blame. This is the fact of history. This is what happened. Sylvania Olympio, Patrice Lumumba, who else got... Some more of Michael. I mean, we, could, we spent two hours listing the casualties of this war that was raged against us. How can someone wage war against you? You say it, then you say you're blaming the people that wage war against you. Somebody invades you, kills your leaders. Every time your leaders rise up, they kill them. Then you say you blaming. Blame is not a word. This is a word that is used a lot of times by white supremacists to deflect from facts of occurrences that are documented. We are not here to blame or absolve anyone. We are here to talk about what occurred in history. And even if you were, even to, to your point, if we were to use it to today, that has to do with will and carrying on the torch. Okay, let's, we got our independence 60, 63, some of us 70 years ago. If we really wanted to today, we could do it. It's a matter of will. Do you have the will to do so? We can't. You you, you can't get upset. Like, look, do we have the will? When, you make it the, as hard as possible for other Africans to travel with to another African country when you are putting up as much barriers economically to trade with your they're government. They're putting up barriers inside the same, the country. You talk about even internationally, there's barriers inside the country. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the thing is, there's barriers in the countries. We're always, this is not about being smart or not being smart. Mm -hmm. This is about understanding. Intelligence mm -hmm. is relative. It's a matter of understanding and rethinking. Just because, you know, if you have been educated in a certain way and convinced a certain way and also convinced that nobody's waging war on you, that's the biggest accomplishment of imperialists is they convince people that, there's, that, it, that it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. That is some fleeting thing of the past while they're continuously manipulating, mm -hmm. extracting right. and exploiting. Look at what's happening in Congo. So, so how have we come to this point what, where, where we are so weak, easily manipulated and exploited? How did we get there? It's a, it's a multiple approach. So, so, so go, before you come in, I'm sorry. You're asking how we got here? As, right. as if you're asking for your audience that hasn't been following the show? I mean, because the History Channel is clearly laid out how we got here. We've clearly laid out how our empires crumbled. We've clearly laid out 
how white supremacy was created to justify slavery. We've clearly laid out how education was structured to convince Africans of their own inferiority through church-based, faith-based education. We've clearly laid out how petty medial differences between us have been exacerbated and exaggerated in order to make sure that the disunity continues. We are constantly looking for scapegoats for our condition everywhere except where it needs to be placed. Somebody comes in, in, in this, 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 this place, you, but Jabari and myself are sitting here. They hit everybody over the head, they take all of our possessions. The three of us left here with empty hands and you start fighting Jabari, I start fighting you, you leave Jabari, you start fighting me, I start fighting Jabari. And then the people who've taken everything are sitting there, they come in as the referees and we say, yeah, that's what's happening. Mm -hmm. And we can't let go because it's been so ingrained in us that things that are not going to carry us into the future are more important than our future. They would rather hold on to fictitious boundaries drawn by colonialists mm -hmm. than to step into their future. Mm -hmm. They would rather hold on to arbitrary, almost petty divisions instead of thinking about surviving into the future. Mm -hmm. Psychological warfare is, is, is more powerful than physical warfare mm -hmm. against people. Ego, ego it, as well. It, I yeah, would say ego as people. well. But I, I really want to, every, every human being has ego. Ego I, can be used. I, I would say, the reason I would say that only in, in, in regard to, compared to, let's say, back compared to what we're talking about right now where you had people in the torch understood yeah you know they still cared about the sovereignty of their countries but many of them were willing to sacrifice for the greater cause where right. they would be saying listen molly you had the president of molly say listen our people are willing to give up a degree of sovereignty if we have a unified africa that is powerful that's in control of its own destiny we are willing to take that versus those who I want to be the sole president uh, uh, of this small little country. However, this Africa else don't, don't even care. That's where the issue comes from. That was the only point I wanted to bring up. Okay. Absolutely. I agree. So this is uh, the picture of the, the previous picture is a picture of uh, the king of Morocco who called the conference, mm -hmm. Muhammad Yusuf. He's a grandfather mm -hmm. and a very close resemblance to the current king i think they look a lot alike before we get into the monrovia group before we get into the monrovia group i need to make quick side notes um the casablanca group also advocated a meaty united africa with a common currency foreign policy defense structure and economic platform that was the african political union african high command and african common market and they all signed the african charter on january 7, yeah. 61. yeah so you can go to X. The Monrovia Group. Yes. So I hope you guys are really, I don't know how well you can see the pictures, but um, these are some really powerful pictures. You know, before you get into the Monrovia Group, Tudman was the Don Dada of all of these Africans. Selassie was a whole emperor. He was a whole emperor and very, very well educated. People don't realize how, how incredibly brilliant Haile Selassie was. Even though he did some negative things, you can say he was an oppressive you know, king, but he was a king. He wasn't a president, he wasn't elected, he was there by his birthright, so different debate. But he had so much reverence for Tubman. Everyone had this reverence for Tubman. And so when Tudman spoke, he was more powerful than the king of Morocco and the emperor of Ethiopia. The rest of Africa listened to Tudman. Tudman abstained from the Casablanca meeting. 
I don't know if you noticed that when I had a list of countries there, right? So th there was no Tubman there. Tubman went to the other Pan-African Conference in 1954. He did not go to Morocco. Now he calls a meeting in Monrovia. So you can go ahead, Jabari, and read about the Monrovia Conference. Unless you have some to ask us. Yep, so the Monrovia group was the alliance first met in on May 8th and it lasted until May 12th of 1961 in Monrovia. The group was composed of that, that should be composed of a lot of different countries. Um, it was an African. Um, next, this looks a lot like the Casablanca group. This looks a lot like the Casablanca group. Um, I will go off of. Um, oh, I will go off. I, of I, have, yeah. I have some stuff on the Monrovia group. So, yeah, so. This is the Casablanca. Yeah. So they met in Monrovia, and the countries there were Ethiopia, Liberia, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Somalia, Togo, uh, Tunisia, Congo, Brazzaville. Yeah, you can close the slide, Dennis. That that's an error. Yeah. So the so last uh, some yeah. of the some it of doesn't the, like the picture. <laughs> yeah. yeah, the Monrovia the Alliance countries. did the, though it did occur um, on the eighth of May to the twelfth. The rest of the information is not correct. Yeah, so it included countries like Ethiopia, Sierra Leone, Nigeria, Tunisia, Ethiopia. Nice. Um, some of the points that they made was they accepted the idea of cooperation among African states, but they rejected immediately political union or the leadership of any one country. They were very module, graduates, and they were regionally oriented. And um, that they is, promoted nationalism, which is a very important one. Yep. So they, the Morovia group promoted nationalism. They were all about maintaining the nations as they were. Yep. So this mm -hmm. was the biggest distinction is that the Morovia group was not in favor of merging countries. Mm -hmm. Yep. So the Monrovia conference, they said the unity is that aim to be achieved at the moment. It's not political integration of sovereign states, but unity of aspiration and of action considered from the point of view of African social solidarity and political identity and the president Sura Nana, Sura Nana of Madagascar he said we contend we intend to conserve the total sovereignty of our states I should underline that our adhesion means by the same token a rejection of a formula for a federation of African states because federalism presupposes the surrender of a large part of national sovereignty Similarly, we would reject a confederal formula, seeing that the authority we superimpose on the states might impose demands, which would be unacceptable for certain of us. Yes. Now, yeah. here's here's the here's the thing that so the, the big distinction here to simplify it is that you're talking about maintaining the, the existing colonial boundaries. You're talking about a bunch of people who um, have taken power, and they do not want to relinquish power. This really is not about national sovereignty. This is about everybody wants to be king. Yep, everybody that's, wants to be king. Yep, that's yep. really what it boils down to. Every so this whole nah, we would go with decentralization because we want to localize power. It's really because everybody wants to wear a crown. Yeah, everybody it's not wants because to be it's what's best for the people. Mm -hmm. It's because everybody wants to have authority over the local area so that they can wear the crown. So they push this message of national identity. There was no national identity. You were colonized. Somebody drew a line around you and said, this is who you are. Mm -hmm. Only Ethiopia and Liberia really had national identities. And you have this idea coming forth where they're like, nope, we don't, we don't want any kind of federation at all whatsoever. Any organization we we have is going to be loose, kind of like the African Union. I'm sorry, not African Union. The um, the League of Nations, where they don't really have any real power, and they wanted to model whatever they're doing after the League of Nations. That all these nations are completely separate. These little broken pieces of glass cannot hold water. Mm -hmm. African states are broken pieces of glass that cannot hold water. Instead of them sealing this glass into a few different cups or bowls. They decided to roll, continue with these broken pieces of glass. Mm -hmm. The exact way the Europeans shattered the continent is how they wanted to maintain it. And it mm -hmm. was not an accident. You had French authorities 
heavily counseling because these countries when they became independent, you, they were still relying on their colonial masters to advise and finance them. So they're telling them, don't listen to these crazy people, you region. Why would you want to do that? Because they knew very well. If you have former French colonies merging into countries with, for, as, with and former British colonies, the French and British no longer have control. If Guinea and Ivory Coast and Liberia and Sierra Leone and Togo, Ghana, Nigeria, Burkina Faso, if this is one place, this is no longer a French or British colony. Because you cannot merge those countries together, erase those boundaries, and have these former colonial masters be still relevant. It would break those chains, those economic chains. And imagine these colonies were still feeding the European economy as they are today. They're still yeah. doing it in 2023. Mm -hmm. So they're not going to allow this to happen. Mm -hmm. and so that's even though this occurs in Morovia, Nkrumah is like, well, I'm still going to push for this. Sekou Ture is like, I'm still going to push for this. So mm -hmm. there were still leaders that are like, okay, whatever. You want to have your own country? No problem. Maybe we'll do it down the road. They still kept pushing the Pan-Africanism. So the Morovia conference was anti-Pan-African unity. Mm -hmm. and, and what was Tottenham role? Because as a young man in high school, I learned he was being used by the, um, the United States. Tottenham, he walked my mind. <laughs> Tottenham was, Tottenham was the administrative arm of American imperialism in Liberia. Mm -hmm. Sudman so tried to balance that, and we've talked about this in the past. We didn't have the economic power. We didn't have a lot of things. Sudman didn't want to die. And he thought maybe if I can put these schools in all of these places, if Liberian children can learn and be educated, maybe tomorrow they will break these chains. So he tried to walk the line. I know this because I read what he wrote and things that he said. He really believed that all of these education initiatives, the human capital, he thought that these faith-based education initiatives that he promoted and grew under his administration would position the human capital in Liberia to be able to solve the problems that his generation could not solve. And unfortunately, it was a bad miscalculation because the education system was not led by people who had a Liberian-centered mentality. It was people who didn't like Liberia who was who were creating the, the curriculum. And, and you think Tadmo didn't know that, that what he was doing eventually was going to result into what we have today? Absolutely not. Mm -mm. Why would he do that? Why wouldn't he just keep everybody illiterate? No, I mean, because that, that was the exact reason, as we learned from the history of China. That's why Barclay, you know, was warning him. And Tudman, as we learned here, was picked for that very purpose. Yeah, Barclay wasn't warning him necessarily about the schools. No, I mean about how to proceed, because as you said, he was going to be an administrative arm of American imperialism. Right. So Barclay, Barclay and that being was not to a, benefit okay. Liberia. Okay, I'm sorry. Ask, ask the question again. I thought yeah. you were talking about something else. No, not something else. I, I mean, because the whole idea of going against the uh, United States or the supranational government, I said mm -hmm. it was Tudman being manipulated, and he knew what the uh, the the end result would be. That is, it's not going to be good for Liberia, but he took it anyway because of his own selfish ambition and what he would get. The end think. result of what? You're talking about Firestone? I, I'm talking about what Africa a federated is. state, a federated state. What Africa is today. Yeah, so oh, Barclay, Barclay Biden. didn't like Barclay didn't like the sabotage of the federated Africa. He didn't see fit. So Barclay was a torchbearer of the original vision of Liberia, which was 
really a federated Africa. Liberia gave birth to this. If you read Roberts, if you read Benson, if you read uh, uh, Warner's speeches, their idea was not just the boundaries that they had. They wanted to expand mm. Africa into a huge and powerful state that would be strong enough to resist. So this idea of even Arthur Barclay them being part of UNIA and reaching across the ocean, reaching across Africa and trying to push this vision of a united people, a stronger people. Tudman comes in now and the greatest breach, I understand what you're asking and you're correct, Dennis. The greatest breach was this, we are not going to have a united region. We're gonna to stick to the boundaries that were drawn. That is one of the biggest things that created a rift. It is not the only thing, but it's one of the biggest things that created the rift between Tudman and the torchbearers of Liberian sovereignty. Mm -hmm. also, they were saying, this is our opportunity to do what the people who established this country have always wanted to do, mm -hmm. which is expand our country to unite our region under one strong umbrella. And you're saying no to this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have we have so much. We have Dosen who said that uh, in, in his speech, he said uh, he dreamed of seeing a West Africa like an ECOWAS with Monrovia, Liberia being the center and the capital of it. And this was back in the 1920s. And, and every, yes, and everyone, sorry to cut you off, Jabari, I just wanted to say this real quick. Everyone, even if you go back to the 1800s, the 1870s, 1880s, even King Samori Toure said, Liberia, I am waging a war of unity. Join me. We said this in the Samori Toure episode, if you can remember, Dennis. Mm -hmm. This is what you wanted. Join me mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. unite our people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. under this Madinka empire. It's, 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 it's something that Tubman did that many felt, and Barclay being the torchbearer for his uncle and Dosen. And the, the reason they trusted Tubman initially, Dennis and Jabari and listeners, is because Tubman was a protege of J.J. Dosen. This is one of the reasons Barclay thought that Tudman was going to do what he wanted, what, what, what everybody was expecting. Remember we talked about how he admired Dosen so much. But for some reason that I cannot even begin to speculate, Tudman did not follow through. And maybe, like I said, maybe he didn't want to end up dead like Nkrumah. Mm -hmm. I mean, he died eventually. We always say this on the show. Everybody's going to die anyway, but he ended up dying. But not, you know, maybe he would have died sooner. Maybe he didn't want to die in 1960. You know, but that extra 10 years he lived, for what? He could yeah. have done something that would have changed the course of history mm -hmm. for Black people around the world. Mm hmm when Ghana, when Mali and Guinea all gained their independence, and this is why I brought up ego uh, earlier, when Ghana, Guinea, and Mali gained their independence, one of the first things they did was they all three of them got into a union and they said, hey, yo, Liberia, can you come and join this union? They said, yo, come and join this union that the three of us have. You have Kwame Nkrumah, you have Sekou Toure, the grandfather, the grandson of Samori Toure, you had the president of Mali, all of them, though the people that would become the Casablanca group, saying to Liberia, come and unify with us. Come, let's unify together. And Tubman says, uh-uh, I, I want a, a commonwealth of independent African states. Which not means, even really a commonwealth, it's nothing. Yeah. <laughs> he wanted nothing. <laughs> he wanted, he wanted, wanted be, he uh, wanted what we have today. I want to be the president of Liberia. That 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 the king statement, I'm the president of Liberia, not the president of the black race type motto. I want to be the president of Liberia 
for my own power, my own ego perspective, but I don't care about the greater good of the continent of Africa. Because, it was, focused, because it was a puppet of the, of the West. Yes. And because of that, because of that, I want to be just the president of Liberia or I want to be president of this small country that was artificially bordered, created. It makes you vulnerable. What example? Zimbabwe is a prime example of why you need a united Africa. When Zimbabwe said, we are going to take back our land, we want to get the resources, take our own destiny, boom. All those European nations instantly slap sanctions on them. Because you don't have a united Africa, Zimbabwe is completely vulnerable. And as a result, the economy crashes. So you have economic embargo against Zimbabwe executed by its neighboring countries, which supposedly have black governments mm. because they don't control their own economies. Mm -hmm. So economic embargoes, you know, basically starvation, they're going to starve you out of, you know, and, and it, it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. Um, I don't know what's going on. I think I sent you the wrong slide. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> that so these are yeah I did. These are some pictures um, we can go through really quickly. Um, I absolutely uh, love how many photos there are of Tubman doing all kinds of stuff. This this was uh, taken in Ghana, and there's some kind of ritual with the you know the traditional dancers and stuff. This is really cool. Yeah, you can see you can see him standing there with a sword, you know. Barclay Barclay got tired with him. He is sitting there. Yeah, Barclay got tired with him, and we talked about you know the Barclays and the the fight <coughs> and coming. And then this, of course, is a very powerful, um, a very powerful picture of a of, of Jomo, the great Jomo Kenyatta, with. Uh, with Tudman. And one of the things I want you to know is that Jomo Kenyatta was, of course, one of the greatest Pan-Africanists that ever was. Such a decent testament to, um, to African unity, um, such a testament to um, the liberation of, of East Africa. And he serves as an inspiration even to this day for people like uh, Paul Kagame and many, many others. Uh, he's there with his European style crown on his head though, <laughs> because again, he's a product of colonialism and that's what we like to mimic. Um, but he was, he was actually one of the great thinkers and forerunners of African thought. Uh, this particular picture um, was taken in 1964. And you've got, uh, um, who is this again? I think this is, um, I'm not sure who this other person is in the photo, I'm sorry. But this is, uh, you know, the 1964 uh, conference in Cairo. So I can't recognize that other person. Hmm. Tudma is bluffing. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I just will always stick in my mind that has leaves a bitter taste in my mouth with Tubman is, is that people have so much respect for this man. And in my 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 opinion, he, he underperformed. I mean, you, you had the gratitude of Kwame Nkrumah showing up at your funeral, show, and, and all of them showing up, and, and you underperform. Or, or, or you, I mean, you know, yeah. We talk about, so I, I, I try to paint a holistic picture. This, this particular picture, of course, is at the, the, in Ghana in April of 1954 
at the, the gathering of African peoples that was organized by Kwame Nkrumah. You can see him there walking with Nkrumah. Um, Nkrumah had great reverence for Liberia, so did Sekou Toure, so did mm -hmm. um, so many of the early African leaders look to Liberia. And it wasn't really about Tudman. It was about the country he represented. Mm. Because all of these leaders, when they were children, they looked to Liberia with great reverence. And so Tudman being the president got that reverence and that respect. And Tudman was also a great statesman, well-trained diplomat. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't in diplomacy, you really, it's, it's about country. It's not about the representative of the country. So it, it, it's twofold. So Tudman's representing the, 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 the country that brought the vision of modern statehood to Africa. So he, of course, is going to be treated with great reverence everywhere he goes. But unfortunately, what has happened is Liberia has been erased from the good commentary of African history by Liberians who have been taught to hate their country. So now you have a student being positioned, Kwame Nkrumah, who was a student of Liberian Pan-Africanists, being positioned as the innovator of Pan-Africanism. And that is absurd. It is an affront. And it's not true. Nkrumah himself looked to Liberia. But because of our own internalized mindset, even Liberian children believe Nkrumah began Pan-Africanism. And this is not OK. But, but, but Carl, why would, wouldn't they, if Tudman, who they were looking up to, sabotage the effort of Pan-Africanism? He didn't oh, sabotage the did effort it? of Pan-Africanism. He, he didn't sabotage the effort of Pan-Africanism. He took a different approach to Pan-Africanism, an approach that 99.9%, .9%, I'm exaggerating, of African people on the continent today agree with. Well, uh, yeah, you so are. If you talk to a Ghanaian today, you tell a Ghanaian to merge with Togo or Ivory Coast, they will not want to. So, no African that I've ever spoken to, an intellectual or otherwise, alive today, thinks there's anything wrong with the OAU being formed the way it was. That is not the argument. Right. But mo many of those Africans I've spoken with, and that's why they look towards Liberia like, oh, like we are the problem. We caused this, right? So Labre does not get that respect because of what Tupman did and not how- I disagree. I think Labre doesn't get that respect because Liberia was plagued with a group of people in the 1970s that reigned propaganda against themselves in their own country. I, I disagree. Such, you can disagree, but it's a fact. I have been doing this for a very long time. Hmm. Even my elder, my elder who mentored me as a teenager, as a history professor, when I met with him in Minnesota in April and I presented him with a gift of the pictures, photographs of the first five presidents, he turned his head to the side and he looked at me and he said, I am so happy I lived to see this day come. He said exactly what I said. Professor Alkati went to Ghana and worked with Nkrumah in his youth. This man said to me, when he got to Ghana, and met a Liberian there. And he was talking about the Pan-African legacy of Liberia. The Liberian went to him and said, no, those people were apartheid people. They didn't let us go to school. They enslaved us. You telling me we're not still doing it to this day? Everything that comes out of our mouth about our country, 133 years, the same group of people run the country. It's she like we have been, let me, let me, let me learn. It's like we've been programmed, the internalized hatred that we spew about ourselves and our people to the extent that we even diminish our own humanity as so-called indigenous people. Just to prove a point that the bearers mm -hmm. of the Pan-African spirit, oh, they were slave masters. I mean, we have regurgitated this thing yeah. all yeah. over Africa, everywhere well, we've gone. That's, that's, that's a different issue in my opinion. It is exactly what the issue yeah. is. Because 
the same people that you claim that are upset that we have an OAU and not a one country or four country Africa, if you tell them today to merge with the Ivory Coast, they will say, hell no. Yeah. Tubman mm -hmm. did not invent tribalism in Africa. He was not the only person at the Morovia conference be damning that they yeah, didn't I'm want to to say it. <laughs> that, that, that lets all the other countries here, lets Nigeria off the hook, it lets Ethiopia it, it, off It's like it's, we like to do this where we like to find yeah. a scapegoat, and the scapegoat must always be a Liberian. Right, but that's that's what that's what uh, we, we're doing now when we say, hey, this problem started in the 70s. Here is a man who has been handpicked, as you, as we say on the History Channel, that he was not even elected. He was picked by the West for this very purpose. He, he, he effectively carried that out. And we say, no, he's not responsible or he's not. Is he the only one, though? But here's the thing. But here's the thing, though. Even if we were to use that point that he was handpicked, his vice president wasn't. So even after he died, his vice president tried to reverse everything. You had that group of people, the, the Bacchus Matthews of the world. When they killed. tried to reverse it, they killed him. <laughs> they killed him and started making up sick lies against him. Yeah, he had a daughter, me, yeah. a king, and all kind of weird things to justify his murder. Look, the bottom line is this. Tubman is, was not Liberia. Mm -hmm. Liberia is an old country. And the men who were presidents and leaders at the time that Tubman was president and they were becoming independent, they remember J.J. Dawson. They remember Edward Wilmot Blyden. Those Tubman, Tubman. men, let me land. Those men remember Arthur Barclay. Mm -hmm. Nigerians still talk about Liberian people that preceded Tubman. You understand? Mm -hmm. So now Liberia has been erased from the respectable commentary of African history because we have learned to demonize our country. It's on and, autopilot. And encourage others to do so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's an and anti Liberian you try to, to the If you try to say one good thing about Liberia, the first people who get emotionally triggered are Liberians. Mm -hmm. We have to ask ourselves why. Yeah. With all of the knowledge that we have today, why are we still emotionally triggered when anyone says anything positive about our country? It's an mm -hmm. anti, it's an autopilot and it's an anti-Liberian statement. It, they are autopilot programmed to be anti-Liberian. I have somebody tell me I had somebody tell me just today that we needed European colonialists to teach us how to govern, how to worship God, how to do all of these things right. That when you go to the Catholic Church in Nigeria or the Anglican Church in Nigeria, it's better organized than the Catholic Church in Liberia because they did not have black bishops until mm. more recently. Right. And that mentality is, started because of 1970. That's not what I'm saying. What I was talking about is the spread of the negative propaganda against Liberia mm -hmm. by Liberians, which other Africans are regurgitating started in the 1970s. Yep. That's what I'm saying. I was being very specific. There's been anti-Liberia propaganda going on since the turn of the, 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 the 20th century, the 19th to the 20th century. But that particular thing where the hate speech against Liberia, where every time you put something on Liberia, the first people, Nigerians, Ghanaians, oh, that apartheid country. Everybody exactly. wants to take a dump on Liberia and Liberians are okay with that. Because they themselves, this would never happen. If Ghana had the legacy of Tudman, we would not hear the end of it. Mm. And let we don't even have show, to do that. Show me, show yeah. If Sierra Leone, we are we oh, just so say that same stuff about Kwame Nkrumah. Say that same stuff about Nambi Azikiwe in front of the Nigerian, and you'll be checked with the quickness. Say that about mm. the Congo and Patrice Lumumba, and they will check you. But when it comes to Liberia, and right. we sit and we correct them and we check them, we're demonized. And say, oh, that's not what happened. Why are you co-signing that? 
So, so, so those people, uh, those people that you named Lumumba, uh, Kwame Nkrumah, and the Jomo Kenyatta, if you put their records against Tatma, what do you find? First of all, those men, those men like Talbert, I would more compare them to Talbert than Tatman. You put their records against Talbert in the short term that Talbert served, Talbert accomplished much more. If we're going to be honest here, mm -hmm. if we go back and we look at what he did at the UN, if we look at the letters he wrote, his advocacy for those very countries, his advocacy against apartheid, Tudman, the reason we had the, 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 the laws change, the citizenship laws change, mm -hmm. the USAID comes in, they get a bunch of young Liberian lawyers, dictate to them what they want to do with the citizenship laws. Do you know what caused that? It was Talbert coming in and telling South Africans, you're not a citizen of South Africa, then you're a citizen of Liberia. So you have prominent South Africans running to Liberia for citizenship. Mary Makeba. Yeah, that's Hugh Masakela. That's Tubman, not Tubman. I said Talbert. So my even, point here is talking about Liberia, and I said before, if you're going to compare these men to anyone, you will compare them to Talbert, not Tubman. Mm -hmm. Why? And Talbert is demonized along with Tubman, along with everybody going back to Joseph Jenkins Roberts. Mm -hmm. because of the mindset, yep. the propaganda against Liberia in the 1970s during the Talbert administration. There was no propaganda against Tubman when Tubman was president. Yeah. Because he suppressed everybody. This man was a dictator. He was not suppressing other Africans. Yeah. And they were holding him in high reverence. Mm -hmm. Soon as Talbert and, 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 comes and he, in, and, and, and if we want soon to as pull, Talbert comes in, the anti-Liberia propaganda goes into overdrive. Mm -hmm. And if we want to be real about it, if we want to be real about these other places, like you said, those leaders, last time I checked, okay, Namdi Azikawe was a great leader, but guess what? Less than 10 years after he left office, his country was in a civil war that ended up killing 3 million people in a genocide with evil people in the Biafran territory. If we want to be real about Jomo Kenyatta, he rejected a citizenship law that would allow black Americans to come in. If we want to pull that, you want to pull that anti tubman that anti tubman anti Talbert, I can easily. No, I said Tubman, I said Tubber. So let's, let's, let's. Let, let's talk about Talbert. Let's, but the thing about it is these, none of these men were perfect. Mm hmm Nani Ezekiwe was no, an African. We're not talking perfection here. We, we're talking the West using Tubman to, you know, to carry out what they wanted and not what was good for Liberia. But who did oh. the West not use? That's what I'm about to say. I'm like, it's not like the West didn't use Jomo Kenyatta. Like, the British were really close to Jomo Kenyatta. Why is it that we know Tubman was a puppet, but there were other leaders that were puppets as well? So <laughs> let's, 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 let's back up a little bit. I think the issue, I understand what Dennis is saying. Dennis is trying to say because Tubman was installed that the other presidents were not installed. All of them were installed, Dennis, all of them. Remember when I said during, um, I don't remember which, I think it was during the Barclay uh, episode, and I said to you that Tubman was the prototype for what mm -hmm. was to come. Mm -hmm. All of them were installed. The difference is some of those installed people, because all of them were elites, extreme elites. Hmm. Sekou Toure was literally the great grandson of Samori Ture. He was almost like a div divine being in Ghana. He was okay. like a Madinka, a Maninka king. And he had a privileged world class education. He lived in a palace before independence. Sekou Ture didn't play the game that they put him in power to play fully. The same thing with. All of the first presidents, Kwame Nkrumah was not some normal guy. He was not some average person. He was not some average freedom fighter. Kwame Nkrumah came from extreme privilege. Jomo Kenyatta. Mm -hmm. Patrice Lumumba. All of these people went to the best schools in the world. Yeah, they went to yeah, school no, in no France. Hmm? I said, no doubt. They were, they were and so they were, they, were, they were given the countries to rule. It was almost like a handover. Nobody elected these people. 
I'm about to say because Kwame Nkrumah himself was the prime minister of the Gold Coast before Ghana even got its independence. He was a puppet. The difference was he was also privileged to be one of these people who became a Pan-Africanist and then sought. Who, who are but, 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 but the they country, were installed. Like I mean, they had this vision, right? And Tadma was just willing to play along. So, I mean, but Tubman had his own vision. It may I, not think, I think out. Tubman did more to, to build educational institutions across Liberia than any of the people you just mentioned did in their own countries. During Tubman's era, the literacy rate in Liberia was way mm -hmm. higher than most of those places that you've mentioned. This, this and so this is places. why I focused on his human capital development. Because Tubman made sure you've got Mullenberg mission. Most of those big schools that were built in Lofa, in Nimba, in Bong, in Cape Mount, at that time, Bopu and Cape Mount, were, I mean, in Lofa were the same place. In, the, in, 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 in Sino, at Greenville, in Harper, most of these schools were well-funded. If you look at the budgets for those schools in the 1940s and 50s and 60s and compare it to the, to the to national budget percentage-wise, right. There's no comparison if to what compare, anyone has done since then. If we compare that to what Kwame Nkrumah was doing in Ghana, Tadma didn't. Kwame Nkrumah did not have that kind of national education. If you go to northern Ghana, there, where did he build schools? In his ethnic areas, right? He was a Pan-Africanist, but he was also, where did he build schools in Ghana? I mean, so we like to deify and justify everything and excuse other people for not being perfect but we have to demonize ourselves no it, it's not it's, it's history they, they tried it's to kill Kwame Nkrumah they took his statue and dragged it through the streets of Ghana yeah because he was a tribalist in a sense they felt he was a tribalist Nkrumah's mm -hmm. statue was dragged through the streets of Ghana right. Sekou Toure had to literally protect his life right we and bury him in Ghana. Ago. It was. It took until when for them to return his body to Ghana. Right. You know what I'm saying? We can't use that as a measure. With all it, of that, yeah. Ghanaians still do not go around the world exaggerating his flaws. In fact, they're telling the world that Kwame Nkrumah invented Pan-Africanism. And he clearly did not. They have gone as far as to call Liberia, I mean, Ghana, the place of return. Ghana is now usurping the history of Liberia because Liberians hate themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, 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 anyway, but I, <laughs> I don't true. believe that, that because Liberians hate themselves. Liberians but, do hate them. They hate their country. Yeah, but, but I, Liberians I, I, hate I, I, their I, country, I, generally speaking. I mean, we can move. When we can you move say on. a nice thing about yeah. Liberia, I can't see all of them to can't cuss you for yeah. saying good thing about Liberia. I, I, I that would not happen anywhere else. I would else. definitely say to a certain degree it does have to do with hate. We yeah, hate I mean, ourselves. I mean, I mean, look, because look if we did, because if we did, Liberia would be at the center, not Ghana. You would have Liberians right. making videos. Liberians video. hate their country. They hate themselves. They hate each other. Any little excuse a Liberian person, they even invent things to have reasons to hate themselves. We get ready. Oh, we from the Southeast. What is that? Is that even a thing? Where is the Northeast? Where is the, 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 the Southwest of Liberia? Where is the Southwest region? They just make up reasons. To, de to, to, to divide themselves. Right. But it is not out of the blue. And you have, it's like, anyway, let, let's move forward because we When do we forward. evolve? When do we evolve? The country, I mean, look at the country. Where, where are when we? do we evolve? Who's going to fix the country? That tribalism right. will fix the country? Right. Where, where are we? What's the res what's responsible for the high level of the responsible, the What's responsible for like Liberia being the way it is is the citizens. Themselves? They're citizens, and the citizens always sitting there looking elsewhere to respect instead of inward. We don't respect anything. We have xenophilia. We love everything outside of Liberia. In general sense, I mean, I'm not being absolute here, but it's a fact. Even though we have had all of these shows, mm. I have spent over a year presenting all this evidence and still 
you've got people saying one group of people ran the country for a certain amount of time. Thank you. If, if, yeah. if because they, they are stuck. Be because they are stuck in the brainwashed mindset that they will want to carry to the grave. My only hope is we don't pass this hatred to the next generation. Yeah, that's that's my only hope. Yeah, that's strong. Like this hatred. But, but let's, it is hatred. Let, let's, <laughs> let's, 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 let's move forward as we are. So we can bring in a few colors here. I have colors on the line already. But let's finish the presentation first. So this is just I think a picture. these are pictures uh, now. Yeah, tub. Yeah, so these are just general Pan African pictures. Of course, you got him there with Halle Selassie. Yeah. Tubman there, acting like Pan Africanism, Pan Africanist. <laughs> but let, let's. Uh, and, I mean, and he, he was. He was. He was. In fact, he was. In fact, um, he was a. He was a nationalist as most of the people that attended the Moroga conference were, every single one of them insisted that they did not want to merge. Right, because so they, they were the not rule. the only one. They wanted to keep the boundaries. They wanted to keep the broken right. glass pieces and continue with that. Now, my thing is, it is important for us to look at everything critically, but the extreme demonization of people who did far better with far less than what we have today. And there is not a president in my, well, there's not a president within the last few presidents that has done a fraction of what Tubman, accomplished a fraction of what Tubman did, even with all of the, the, the flaws and all. So we can sit here and say what we want. And even Talbert, fell short of some of the things that Tubman did because Tubman had understood, maybe because he was a dictator, how to keep the country from unraveling. He knew how to walk the line and play his cards to keep us from tumbling into chaos. Mm -hmm. And Talbert failed because Talbert trusted situations he shouldn't have trusted, but that's a different discussion. But it's because of Talbert, during Tubman's administration, there was no war in Liberia. You, there was no uh, 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 tribal warfare for the first time in the history of the country. It was that 27 years of actual peace, even in the hinterland. You didn't have people chopping each other's heads off, having clan wars during his administration. Hmm. It never it, happened while he was president. As they say, the absence of war is not peace. But let's let let me announce uh, that's what you're gonna say in that situation. The yeah. absence of war is not peace because the, the, where, the where, where did you see clans people shopping each other up in the hinterland during Talbert? It happened. It happened as soon as Talbert died. It wasn't long, and they started back with their tribalism and started killing each other. That's how we're all where we are. We we love we just love the projection. Like, it's not. It, it's just crazy. Like all of us have lost relatives to tribal warfare. You want to blame Tubman for that? You want to blame who for that? No, no, we're not blaming Tubman for uh, tribalism, right? The context was speaking in was speaking of Pan Africanism and how this man was a puppet to the West and being used for his own benefit. Look at Firestone. And look at how much Tubman, benef Tub Tubman benefited from these these uh, multinational. I think companies. I think the biggest benefactor from Firestone was King, and we talked about that, and we dragged right. King After through the King, for the things that Tubman. he did. And I think that um, we're very objective when we mm -hmm. talk about what we're going to talk about these presidents, what they did wrong, what they did right. Yeah. Um, same thing when we talked about uh, um, Gardner, when we talk about all of them. But where we're not going, where I'm not going to go down this rabbit hole is when somebody wants to exaggerate and demonize the country. And then we want to justify it because we say because Tubman was installed. Which African country doesn't have installed dictators? Yep. I don't think that should be an excuse. Yeah, I don't think it's an excuse. Everybody How is it an excuse? We we and, and nobody. So, so only like bro, guys saw dictators. So because like bro, the other people no, that got no, installed dictators teach their children to respect their country. 
Right. Nobody the other countries like that have had like massive know. tribal wars like Nigeria that killed more people than the population of Ni Liberia in that Biafra war. And they're still yeah. trying to hold the country together exactly. by teaching them to love Nigeria. Right? Exactly. And where are we? Every time we talk about yeah. any one of our leaders, but it's a problem. We all need to enter and, and then say everything they, uh, because the propaganda people hit Liberia because it started in the 70s. I it, said specifically the other African countries learned from our progressives to hate Liberia. Okay. And it was in the 70s. And I have evidence. I have people who have said the anecdotal experiences. I've read upon articles upon articles that were pumped into West African journals by our people, much of which was lies, how we had a, a mulatto hegemony. Uh, indigenous people were never taught how to read and write. They were not allowed to go to school. We had apartheid. That's all yeah. 1970s propaganda by Bacchus Matthews them. It's I not they say, no their writings are in ink, they are permanent and forever, and they will live forever. So you can tell me that I'm wrong, but it is documented. They wrote things down and they published yeah. them in newspapers all over Africa, lying and, on and, Liberia. And, and even, and even then, let, let's say Janice. Lying on Liberia, and those lies that they told on this country, the you guys are living with those lies today. We're trying to undo some of those lies today. And the lies that they told, trust me, they knew they were lying. Mm -hmm. I used to think they didn't know. But you can't go and write. You are an educated indigenous person. You go and write that you are not allowed to go to school. Your people are not allowed to go to school. Is that true? Did we ever say that this school is for only America, Liberians, and this school is for only Native it, children. It never happened in Liberia. It, it, and it's not straightforward like that. But, but let's, let us not... But uh, what I'm saying is, when I say in the 1970s, they spread propaganda against Liberia all over Africa. For that reason, Africans do not respect Liberia. I'm backing it up with facts. It's not something I and, pulled and, out and, of my nose. Yep. And, and, and to go further, let's say... And, and I want to address your point before we get into the calls. Um, right. Even if we use the point that you said, okay, well, Tubman was Western installed, so he inhibited Pan-Africanism to a degree. Okay, even though he 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 made the Monrovia group, it still led to the organization of African unity in the African Union, which is still in his, ex his existence today. He it's still a, a, yeah, and the, he's still dead assisted. and it's still useless. He's still he he's dead still and it's assisted. still useless because right. all of these African leaders, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. And then they get caught on your country help. because That's you had, you had these That's people Mandela. lying on Liberia. These it, people who uh, are being pumped up in power by the CIA to lie on your country yeah. because 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 yeah. they felt that yeah. Talbert because Talbert was too have. radical. You so they were have. running around pumping propaganda just like Marias and them did in the in the in the early 1900s. It's a repeat. You and it's going to continue. You still oh, had Tubman. Let's, 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 let's take some calls. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Library History Channel. We are discussing part three. Hey, you said oh. the show was going to be boring, Jabari. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, be a step I wasn't boy. expecting me to get to this level, but uh, I'm yeah. here. Let's, let's, let's get our first caller. Uh, Ambassador Patton, George. Yes, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. Um... Go ahead, sir. But I hear your panelist is, is still speaking. No, 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 no. Turn no I'm not just turn that off. Okay, we're silent. And listen through the uh, phone, please. Oh yeah, yeah. That's probably he's probably getting feedback. Okay, Dennis. Uh, mm -hmm. Looks like I will see what I can do. That, but thank you, and I want to commend you for this program, and to also commend your panelists for uh, this important discussion on Pan Africanism and the role of Liberia. What is true across Africa, in my discovery, is that Liberia, and in fact, Topman indeed, played a pivotal role in, in the, uh, the challenges Africa faced from the very onset of uh, the formation of the OEU, uh, which was responsible for uh, the continent not are forming the United States of Africa. Liberia is blamed. Topman is blamed. 
And the reason why they blame Liberia is simple. And let me tell you this story with Dennis. I served as, as Liberia's ambassador to Ethiopia from 2016 to 2018. That was my second tour of duty in Ethiopia, having served there before as the minister councillor. Are we there, Dennis? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. When I got to Addis Ababa in 2016, I realized that the AU had put up a statue of Kwame Nkrumah. There was a building named after Julius Nereri. Yeah. And in fact, in the AU hall, the, the main complex, there were photographs of African heads of state. And to my surprise, Liberia was not featured among those African leaders. So I got to work. I wanted to make sure that my country had a presence in, in, in the hall. But what I thought to do, given our history, what we were taught in, in, in junior high schools, in, in high schools, and what the role that we were playing in the EU, formation of the ONU and all of that, I thought that I could convince the, the, the commission to find a place for Liberia, just as it did for Kwame Nkrumah and, and Julius Nereri. Mm -hmm. I went to the commission, I did the consultations with members of the commission, leadership of the commission, and with a few ambassadors from Africa on what I wanted to do. I then informed the then Minister of Foreign Affairs, I won't call the name, discussed what I wanted to do, that I wanted to find a place for Liberia in the African Union Commission. I wanted Liberia to be recognized. They advised me to do a concept paper. I did all of that. And so as I went further, I went deeper into consultations. I was advised by the commission that it would be a wrong approach to request for a place for Liberia in the commission because after all, across the continent and within the commission itself, when the people talk about the formation of the OAU and Africanism, they don't mention Liberia. They don't talk about Liberia. They don't talk about Topman. The names you hear are Kwame Nkrumah, Sikou Touré, Julius Nery, the guy from, from Algeria. You don't hear anything about Liberia. Who there today? That's what, that's what you'll find out. And I was concerned. I began to ask questions. Why was it so? that in, 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 in African celebration, when we're talking about the OEU, the formation of the OEU, people didn't have time. They wouldn't even mention Liberia. And then they began to tell me, so look, we're here to tell you this, but you should be aware that if it hadn't been for Tubman, if it hadn't been for Liberia, we, would have, we would have had the United States of Africa today. So across Africa, across the length of Africa, and the thinking in Addis Ababa is that indeed Liberia play a part in stalling the African effort to form the United States of Africa. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Now, the difference between Tottenham and, and Tottenham is simple. Tottenham was a reformist. Whereas Tottenham encouraged the progressives he encouraged a discussion that led to groups of people, students who came abroad and studied and went home. Topman did not encourage that. Topman chased his opponents. We know about Detroit and the rest of them that he chased. That got murdered. That's just that's the difference between the two. And so when the panelists sit in the hall and, and think that. Uh, we, we, we criticize our country. Yes, we had to criticize. People had to criticize the system we had. It was a 5% of the people of Liberia, the population of Liberia, leading everybody else and wanting everybody else to think the way they talked. They wanted us to continue to be in a system where someone would sit and ask you, you, you know who you're talking to? They wanted us to continue to be in a system where someone would say, you are a country boy. I wanted to continue to be in a system where people will shame you for speaking true or speaking telling. That's hard to change. Thank you. That's hard to change. 
That's the point I wanted to make, uh, uh, Dennis. Thank you. Thank you. Th thank you for the call. We, we say you can go ahead before I take other calls. No, I think you should take all the calls. Let them get the the thoughts out. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, yeah the, the phone line got disconnected. I have to reconnect. Okay. So yeah, so it's it's not about um, the presentation that Jabari and myself made was not saying that um, there was not classism. What we're saying is, if you go back and watch all of the episodes, we've clearly laid out um, the concept of Westernization, Christianity, civilization. This is not a belief that's unique to Liberia. This is how education was brought to Africa. That the less African you are. You know, you go to Ghana, if you red, you light skin, you the you the talk of the town. You be dark skin in Ghana, it's a problem. This is how education was introduced to Africa in general. Yeah. And then yeah. to also act as though you don't have classism outside of Liberia or inside yeah. specific ethnic groups is also a fallacy. Okay? You have classism, intra-ethnic classism. Before 1822, before the arrival of the abolitionists on our coast, we were selling each other into slavery. There are whole ethnic groups that migrated to Liberia specifically to trade in human beings. We have had wars. We have conquered each other. Why the demonization of one group of people is the question. And even though we even oppress, not oppress, but suppress our indigenous leaders to, in order to perpetuate this story, it is on this show that we're able to erase the rumor, hopefully stomp it in the ground forever, or not the rumor, the lie of a mulatto hegemony. It is on this show that most people learn that J.J. Dawson was native, that Daniel Howard was native. It is on this show that many people for the first time heard of James II Wesley. Not everyone, some people knew all these things, but most people do not. Because it was in the interest of a narrative to pretend that this never happened. Mm -hmm. You go to Nigeria today and I have very, good friends in Nigeria. Servants in Nigeria have to bow and literally walk out of your, your presence backward. Mm -hmm. In Ghana, the classism is so pronounced. I don't know how many Liberians have really traveled outside of Liberia within Africa to mm -hmm. see Before you get we to Ghana. don't have that in Liberia. Before you get to Ghana, before you get to Ghana, there's a literal caste system in Nigeria in Igbo called the Osu people. They're literally a caste at the bottom that are the untouchables. This is not to justify. Right. And, and, and let, me, let me finish my point, Dennis. Right. This is not to justify. Yeah, I just want to press to interject. Because every let time me, we go to this. No, let me, let me this. finish my point. Then you'll know where I'm landing with all of it, please. Then you can come in. This is not to justify classism. Mm -hmm. It's to tell Liberians that classism is not something unique. that was introduced to us. Or is unique. Because what we do is we complain about situations that have been really exaggerated. I had a conversation with a good friend of mine. I'm not going to name him. I hope he's watching. And he's probably going to get pissed off that I say this. But he told me one time, he said, oh, you know, we had tears of, you know, of, 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 of a miracle Liberians. And I said, there's no such thing as an miracle Liberian. I said, that's an anthropological term that was imposed. He said, oh, whatever. He said, you know, the people who were purely of African-American descent, they were the top and then the Caribbean people, and then the ones who were mixed with native and blah, blah, and then the, the people who we adopted were that. And I said, does that make sense to you? I said, what you're saying, does it make sense to you? I said, what you're doing 
is you're 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 saying that that your proximity to Western to, to Western culture makes you better than someone else. And the closer you are to Western culture, the better you are. I see you don't see the problem with that. How can you be black and be a white supremacist? Mm -hmm. And he paused and he froze. And I said, all of these ideas that I hear, these are 20th century ideas. Mm -hmm. Why did this thought process evolve? When did Liberians start to do this and be anti-African? Nobody who's anti-African goes to Africa. It is part of, it was built into our education systems. Mm -hmm. And all of us went to the same schools. Mm -hmm. We all went to the same schools with the same Catholic nuns, with the same Southern hillbilly missionaries who were telling us, that everything that's African is evil and the further away you are from an African, the better you are. It was not just one group being taught this. Every ethnic group in Liberia was taught the same thing. Mm -hmm. Nobody is telling us to name our children names that are not African today. But if you go into any village in Liberia, the same education system is being perpetuated. We don't have some ruling class but what's happening? We all naming our children. Oh, his name is is is. Uh, uh, they just make up foolishness because yeah. the indigenous names are ugly. It's part of the education process. Mm -hmm. right. and and we don't have to decompartmentalize African people for adopting the way they were to the way they were educated. Mm -hmm. Right. We we can talk more about this. I, I don't want the um, I don't want us to go beyond two two hours. But mm -hmm. what I find is. Anyway, let me take the last call and then we can go uh, because if we don't like by the time and this is is still a PS like justification. If things went because wrong, that's how you want to see it, an yeah, explanation wrong. Let, let an me, explanation. Let me, let, me finish, let me finish, call. Go ahead. If sorry. things went wrong, let's acknowledge them. But by the time you say and you have just said it, right? This is thing, okay, this existed. Oh, tell me. Uh by the time you talk about it, oh tell me you were doing it before we came. Oh, you saw this one. You that does not justify any other wrong actions. We can still. So why doesn't anyone talk Dennis, about all Dennis, the other wrong actions? Dennis, well, let me finish. Let what me is the reason that we don't talk about all of what? our wrong actions? Right. We uh, yeah, I was about to say. I was about to say. Dennis. Dennis. Can I, Dennis. Can I finish. Yeah, let him sure. finish. Right. We can still acknowledge all the wrong actions. Ten persons can be wrong at the same time. But by the why time, don't you acknowledge the other wrong actions? But That's projection, Dennis. What you're doing is projecting. Wrong, you say, oh. Why? But there are other 10 ones. When we're talking about yeah. wrongs, why don't we talk about all Dennis, the wrongs? Why Dennis, is it always Dennis. one wrong that is discussed? Dennis, what about Dennis, all the other wrongs? Dennis, what you are doing? Can I say this? A portion Dennis, of all what are you doing? But by the time you make the wrong, at least acknowledge that, yes, this happened, but X, Y, Z. But the answer but is... But who has not acknowledged it? Dennis, no, That's all y'all talk Dennis, about all Dennis, the time. Dennis, because listen. Dismissive. Dennis, Because you cannot, you cannot dismiss other people's experiences. Dennis, because, Dennis, Hold Dennis, on, Jabari, hold on. Dennis. Anyway, let me take the anecdotes, last one, then we can, we, we can uh, do something. Anecdotes are not hold what hold you on, do. Jabari, let me take the last one. I don't... We, we, we didn't plan to stay over two hours. Go ahead, Elvis. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. John. And, uh, thank you to the panel. The presenters tonight. Uh, I just want to say this, you know, I'm a bit disheartened tonight because we on this platform we have a lot of respect from you know Mrs. You know Famile, and she brings great great value to the platform. And I, uh, I want to thank you, Mr. John, for pushing back a little bit tonight because with all due respect to you know Mrs. Famile, I've heard her say this on one of the shows on Talk, talk uh, Talking Thursday, maybe a year and a half ago. I have a good memory of it. It was an exchange between she and uh, Mohammed Sharif. And Sharif was talking about Tugman at the time, praising him, how he like, was you know, developing on a Tugman. And I think Ms. Ms. Fumler pushed back on him, saying that Tugman was a dictator and he was a puppet of the West. And, you know, in a nutshell, saying that he wasn't a good president and that. Uh, we shouldn't really look fondly on him. A couple of mm. weeks back, when, when the series first started, I called in and I was playing devil's advocate. I said, well, you know, maybe the end, the end justifies the means because even though he was a puppet after he took over from uh, 
uh, what's the president name that he took over from? I forgot. But it was the last Bar- episode Bar- that president was Tup- Barkley. What Tubman was, was was being teased as the next topic, and I called him and I said, well, you know, maybe the end justifies the means because of, you know, under him, like we had a lot of development, and there was a lot of good things. And Ms. Carl went up, she went up for me saying that, oh, I mean, you know, I'm preaching white supremacy. We have to be men. We cannot be, you know, can't subscribe to, you know, subjugating ourselves to the white man just so we can get crumbs and all kinds of things. So tonight, I don't understand it because if we criticize Tubman saying that he was a puppet and he wasn't a great ruler or he was a dictator, ruled for 27 years, we're talking about today. If George Weah leaves the presidency, well, should we pin rosy pictures about him or other things that he did, the incompetence that he showed? Should we pin rosy pictures about him? It would be not, you know, uh, uh, patriotic to not, to criticize George Weah because in many people's eyes, he may not be a great president. And even, you know, I'm a bit disappointed because perhaps maybe it's for personal reasons and I can understand that, that we won't talk about, you know, Tolbert, Dole, and Charles Taylor. Because these people are people who a lot of people have strong personal reactions to. But Tolbert, maybe a lot of people see he was a progressive president, was the best president. For Doe, I'm sure, you know, cutting across ethnic lines, a lot of people said a lot of terrible things about him. Taylor would also be mixed. So this is how Liberian people view their presidents, based on their experience. So if, if you bring up, you know, Charles Taylor, people from from, from uh, Bon County, or people from Nimba, we, we love Taylor, see him as a liberator. You know, at the same breath, those same people will castigate Doe, and the same way from people from 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 Grand Jita will, will praise him and, and saying people was vilifying him for no reason. So that's that's the divide in our country. So when people are talking about these past rulers, although they did a lot of great things, but like Mr. Johnson, there's a lot of things that they did that wasn't so good. So when people criticize them, it's not that we're being unpatriotic. It's just that from what we read, and you can't say everything that we read is wrong, and we're so misinformed. No, 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 no. Mm, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm going to pause just for one second. I'll let you continue in just a second. Elvis, um, you're all over the place. So I'm trying to keep track of what you're saying so I can respond. Um, the last thing you said, the last thing you said is a little strange. I was following you until you started talking about um, when I said, you know, when people praise or criticize people, I've criticized probably every single president that I've presented on, mm-hmm. except Arthur Barkley. Um, I didn't find any reason to criticize Barkley. Um, I mean, I, I criticized pretty much every single president um, and also talked about the, the good side. So, to, to, to the, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not simple minded. Right. I'm not a simplistic thinker. And when you're talking in a specific context, Elvis, which is Pan-Africanism and this president's contribution to building the OAU, which he built, he built the Af- Organization of African Unity. He built the African Development Bank. He built this. It was Tudman who built this. Whether it's a one united Africa or not, that's what we have and Tudman built it. So the people who are carrying his torch can't ignore him. That is a separate conversation and a separate thing from the fact that he wrongfully imprisoned Famula, that he built Bella Yala and sent his political people there. So two things can be true at the same time. Mm -hmm. That's all I'm saying. So you shouldn't be confused because we're not talking about Bella Yala today. We're not talking about the fact that Tudman um, killed Coleman in cold blood like we did last week. Mm -hmm. Today, we're talking about the Organization of African Unity, which is now the African Union which is owes everything to Tubman. And so this is the difference. And, 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 and one of the problems that we have as, like, as, as human beings, it's not a Liberian thing, is that we like to oversimplify stuff. Yes. If somebody stepped on my foot yesterday and tomorrow that person does something incredible, we will not see it. We will only talk about my foot being stepped on. Mm-hmm. Thank we, you. Can I, let me just, let me just no, I didn't want him to stop. I want Elvis to continue. I just want yeah, to point out that part of it. We have five minutes to, to end. Yes, I will leave it on the Pan-Africanism because even within that group of people, a lot of people don't don't like Tubman because if they saw him, you know, like... Even Name him, one person uh, that was uh, at the Morovia conference that didn't like Tubman. One. That didn't... That didn't... 
in the presentation tonight, I think what you're talking about, you're praising uh, Kwame Nkrumah's idea of maybe having like four or five different regions that would become countries, and that would have been better for Africa as a whole. Where but he also... Wanted most, you know, he wanted the countries to keep their sovereignty and not to give up their sovereignty. And that's why most people think the African Union is weak today, because you have sovereign nations who are not allowed to intervene when, when certain things are going on in certain regions. So a lot of people criticize Tubman for going that route rather than bringing more, most of these countries together in the region. Right. Yeah, maybe I didn't do a good job of explaining that, though. That, that, that's not exactly well, true. I'll leave it there. Because Kwame Nkrumah signed off on the Morovia Conference. He was a signatory to that. Yeah. I okay. just want to say this. I want to say but this. Well, I mean, well, I mean, Kuma was a signatory right? to it. Hmm? Yeah, they, they all have to sign up because everything went. They don't up. have to. You don't go to every convention and sign off just so you're right. present. If you object, you don't sign off to it. Because yeah. they had these two groups, right? And mm -hmm. uh, Kuma and the rest of the people are saying, hey, USA. And Tudman and the rest of the people say, OAU. And it went Tudman's way. For no, you, got, you guys are getting this a little wrong. It's a little bit. I see where the disconnect is. I you had to one. go I ahead, Javari. Because I've, I've been trying to say one of the issues Sorry. is, and one of the problems is, whenever we're talking about history, is this it is a problem across the board. It's projection. You people love to project their ideology. Right. I don't like for, for people to go this route, Javari. You can say that without entering the minds of the people and say, hey, it's because you are Dennis. projecting. Dennis, right? here's Dennis. Here's Let a simple. Let stick Dennis, to here's the simple, facts of history. Here's a simple reality. For example, people can say, for example, oh, Tubman was responsible for why we didn't have the United States of Africa. Let's use their claim, okay? Why aren't you saying that same thing about Madagascar? They were there. Why are you not saying that same thing about Nigeria? They or were Ghana. there. Or, or yeah, or Ghana or Tanzania. Why are you just pointing out Liberia? Or Kenya. It's the same thing when we talk about when you said, oh. The uh, African Americans did this to the native population. Okay, I'll give you that. Okay, at the same time, we rarely hear, if ever, about okay, this is what they were doing: the Day Gola War or the Gola Mandingo War. What we and like to why do. Why you say you don't hear that? that. The, the thing is, you're supposed to view history as it is, and history right. is a very complex thing. So to just say reduce it to. African Americans or a country Congo, as people say, and completely forget the Gola Mandingo Wars is too. Yeah, not I mean to it's true. My it's my true. thing, yeah, my thing I, I to bring it back forget. to the Tubman discussion. To bring it back to the Tubman discussion, right. I, just I, I don't think people forget. Is is this out of all mentality, right? Because when people say one, then you say, "How about this?" When other people say this, you say, "How about this?" So why do? Because you, you have to look at everything in the totality. On the table. There's nothing wrong with that. that. About it, right? Let's yes. just lay everything out on the table. This is what. But when we do that, we say, "Oh, you? Why are you bringing up other stuff?" No, right. but, but because you can't, you can't have it both ways, Dennis. When no. somebody is saying, "Here's the broader picture," and here's mm -hmm. the broader context, then you get offended. I'm about to because say, you don't not. want the hold on Jabari because you don't want the broader picture you only want to repeat this one narrative that's when you say true. this is the context that's of the narrative it becomes true. why you got to be bringing what about listen this is what I wanted to say about Tubman hmm. we're specifically speaking of the OAU right there were two competing Ooh. ideologies and Tubman won the Casablanca conference as I said in the very beginning, because people always hear what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. The Casablanca conference was being head by, headed by Morocco. At the end of the day, the other African states looked at it and said, you know what? If we come under one, I mean, there's documentation of their ideas and objections. They didn't want to, it's the same thing that the reason they had an issue with, with Gaddafi. They were like, wait a minute, these Arabs have been treating us the same way Europeans have treated us. There was a racial component. I thought I talked about that when I started my presentation. So for Africans to ignore this, I think it's problematic. So now we want to only talk about the exaggeration. It was not Tudman alone. 
everyone that was a signatory to the Monrovia Conference, to the Monrovia Block, was a willing signatory and gave speeches and reasons why. Mm -hmm. And we know why they were saying it, right? That's what we just said <coughs> on this show. We know why they were saying it. The French were controlling these other guys. Their former colonial powers were controlling them. And we say that's why they were doing what they were doing. Right. Also, that so was not the only reason. So good Multiple things terrible. can be true at the same time. So that is one reason. Mm -hmm. What was the other reason we discussed? The other reason we discussed is that greed. They wanted, yes. They, they wanted, wanted sovereignty over their own people. They wanted dominion over their own people without interference. Was another component, another factor. A mm -hmm. third factor was. They wanted power. For themselves. That was the second factor. It's the same thing. Dominion over the people. Right, the third right. factor was ethnic. That looked like nationalism, right? But it was no, it's not. Dominion over your people and wanting to because what is nationalism? It's a fake boundary. It's broken glass. Mm -hmm. Nationalism. Mm -hmm. The other thing is they had issues really? with people. They had a little bit of xenophobia. You had mm -hmm. certain groups looking at other people saying people are too different from us. We don't want to be bothered with them. Because guess what? There is a form, there is a nationalism. It's called African nationalism. You can have nationalism of being African. You don't have to have Tanzanian. I'm an, I'm an African nationalist. You don't have to be a Nigerian. Pan Africanism is African nationalism. But the, the bottom line here is there were multiple factors. Always remember that two or more things can be true at the same time. Mm hmm. There were multiple factors, but in closing, Dennis, I know you got to go. I got to go. Yeah. In closing, there would be no OAU as or African Union as we see it today if there's one person that is responsible for the existence of African Union, ECOWAS, all of these things that spun out of it. It is William V.S. Tubman. So for him not to be honored in Ethiopia in that way, it's in Addis Ababa, is an affront to history and facts. Yeah, it's contradictory. So you blame Tubman for making the OAU, but you're benefiting from the OAU African. You, you're in the OAU. You say Tubman created it. You've actually created it. So you're not going to honor him. You're going to give credit for the OAU to someone who wasn't leading. It doesn't make any sense. Right. And Liberians are blamed for that. Because they demonize Liberians are blamed for that because we had a movement to discredit our country that was funded. I will send you U.S. State Department papers that were funded by U.S. tax dollars, where you had these half cocked Liberians running around writing lies about their country all over the place, and it's documented. So, unless somebody went back in time and changed documents, just to make call right on this show, that's what it is. And there's nobody can come here and show me anything to the contrary. Mm -hmm. That's what they did. Talking about it, we're not allowed to go to school. The land was taken from them. Where? Who owns the land in Jidikin? I'll tell you who owns the land in Gakhlan. The Gakhlan people own it. All right. Who owns the land in, in Jida, in Grand Jida? Who owns your papa <laughs> land? Yourself own your papa Ooh. land. That's who owns your papa land, like, bro. Yourself owns it. There's this, we expel this thing. But thank you, Dennis. This has been a heated show. Paul, I will give you, I will give people. you before, I just got to say this, Paul, Ahmed, or whoever, River says Pro, that, that is savage. He says, who cares what Ethiopia think? They got civil war now. That is. And imagine Ethiopia talking about Liberia, Ethiopia that were committing genocide against its own people, talking about Tubman. Right. We're allowing people that are doing horrific things to bad mouth our people. Let's get off and hear, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> all here in Liberia, all here. Good night. Happy yeah. Saturday. To, to say we are allowing them or holding Liberia responsible we for that, that, that's, that, the that's, that's the torch bearers of the propaganda against our own country. Yeah. They use us to spread propaganda against our own country. What part of it you're not understanding? No, I understand All of our heroes, the Vakas, Matthews, them. Uh, you know, they, wrote, they wrote lies about their own country. 
Uh, you know what? We should do an episode. Right. But in fact, said Dennis that the next episode. Sorry, I know Man. it's closing. The yeah, next we're, episode we're, of the Library History Channel. Yeah, I am going to show U.S. State Department papers, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm going to show historic documents written by people, and I'm going to debunk the lies that they spread about Liberia in the 1970s. And that's a and show who's behind it. To say and, come, come and don't way. come to my house. My husband packing heat, and so am I. Mm. <laughs> this is a legal carry state. Don't come to my house. But I will expose everything. <laughs> On that note, we'll say thank you, Carl. Thank you, Jabari, for <laughs> the show tonight. Next week, we're going to continue and we'll talk about the 70s. And uh, Carl is going to bring the papers that say, you know, all the propaganda. And we're going to just oppose that with what happened before that time to see whether there was no propaganda and people were all, you know, but that will be part of the show. And when you come, <laughs> read on these things and come prepared. We'll, come we'll prepared to debate. I'll be prepared. I'll right, come. Y'all we'll come. Y'all we'll better come because we're gonna be ready for you. Oh, all right. <laughs> on that note, thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Jabari. Th thank you so much. We want to thank our viewers <laughs> for always joining us. You know, uh, somebody says someone is Saturday, so people will not come. We are writing a history book. Whether we appreciate you to come. But even if we have two persons, we're gonna we're gonna continue to build this library, yeah. And uh, it's gonna live after us. So some of these things will be clarified, so that our country will be better than the way we met it, because our children and the children's children will be armed with more information about our country that we yes. will be able to do something and move it forward. That's why we end with the song that says, "We are all Liberians." Whether you you are Basanyo or you are Ma, Dan, Gola, or Mandingo, we are all Liberians. Let us do our very best to keep and make our country the glorious land of liberty. We are all Liberians.